You can go ahead first. My name is Phyllis Leighton Hagen Sipes. Bruce Strunwald Hanke. Catherine Reinhardt Dunlop. Richard Day. Uh, Carol Waller Filter. All right. Uh, as representatives of St. John's Lutheran Church, we wanted to ask you some questions about the history and maybe your personal attachment with the church. Uh, when was the church created and who was it created by? I have got October 10th of, or October 10th of 1847. And it was started by six families and 20 individuals that asked the pastor in Monroe to come and, and he came for three, uh, three, every three weeks I think it was, to, and then eventually he, he was called to be the pastor. He was the first pastor. Okay. And uh, what circumstances were there to initiate the creation of the church? I think probably they just wanted to all be together and to, be, to have someone to preach the word to them. See anything in church history that said anything about you know any prejudices or anything about it? Right. Okay. So it's pretty much just a community builder and trying to all get together to do the same thing. Were there any protest to the creation of the church? As far as the records go, no. Thanks. Okay. Not till the Second World War or the First World War. Yeah. All right. And would you mind talking about that? you know anything about it? Not really, except for what I have been told, that during the war, because of the German, the war, that they would paint the yellow swastika on the church, because it was a deterioration. And not only that, but one of the, uh, one of the members from St. John's, his family was from Germany, and they happened to be over in Germany, for a vacation or something, or visiting relatives, Richard, you know this, and the war came, the war started, and they were left in Germany, and the young man had to be in the German army, and he served in the German army till they came back to the United States. And how does the church pertain to German heritage? Were there any hymnals written in German or Bibles? Well, everything was German. In fact, I still have at home the German, the German Bible and the German mm -hmm. Hymnal. Yeah. And I just received from my sister who passed away about six years ago, from her daughter last night, uh, German Bibles, German catechisms, mm -hmm. all, kind of, all the things that she had that were German. Very cool. And... Did all of you grow up in the church? I did. I did. I did. I, did. I was I did. born and raised here. Okay. I grew up in a in Detroit at mm -hmm. a Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, and I was called here to teach school at St. John's, and I married into the church, and I married a farmer from the church, and I learned everything from him <laughs> and his family, and that's how I'm connected. Plus. A couple of my relatives were involved with the uh, school and they built the new school and all of that. So my heritage comes within Mary and within the family and with people that came here to help and with teaching in the school. Um, when you were younger in the church, how were the services run? Were they different from they are now? Yeah, yeah there's a prayer of liturgy they used to use here. They also had. Uh, German services. And All were German. Um, everything was in German. Everything was in Before German. World 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 when World I was II. a child. They had, even when I got to be older, they still had at least one Sunday that was at home mm -hmm. in German. They also had the women sit on one side of the right. building in the, of, the, of the aisle and they had the men sit on the other end. For what reason, they don't know. <laughs> but you, you, you can just imagine where the children's at. Mm -hmm. Huh. Um, before, and this applies to any of you, uh, before uh, you actually joined the church, 
what was your and your family's religious background? Was it of a Lutheran background? All Lutheran. Yep. Yeah. I, I don't know any other. I was born and raised, and so and my parents were, especially my my father's parents were members forever. I'd say my. Like, Basically, that was a question I was asked this morning in our Christ care group, and a lot of us were born and raised. We had we had no choice. We yeah. were German, Lutherans, Missouri Synod, and we had no choice. And I was just married into my church because I married my husband and he was Lutheran, so I joined the church. Otherwise, that wise I was not a Lutheran all my life. Okay. But she became a good one. <laughs> we were fortunate to have a Lutheran day school. Mm -hmm. And so we, most of us had gone through that, you know. And uh, we didn't go to the public schools. And that was the only thing that we knew, you know. Right. Uh, so at the, maybe even the Lutheran schools and the church, um, did you guys also regularly speak German to each other, like during the German services, was it required to speak German? Well, you didn't know anything. Yeah. 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 I never spoke German, but my folks did, especially when they didn't want us kids to know what they were talking about. Yeah, yeah my, my grandparents did, and my husband's parents did, but I didn't. <laughs> a few words, but not a lot. Okay. When the congregation was started, it was yeah. also started with the idea that there would be a school with the congregation. Okay, that makes sense. And before World War One, in the Lutheran schools there, everything was German in the morning and English in the afternoon. Hmm. Oh my God, I didn't have to teach them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I could have done it. <laughs> But I had German in school for all nine grades. Yeah. Oh. Are there any specific stories that you guys would like to share about growing up in the church or being brought into a German family that was very Lutheran oriented? Take your I time. think one of the things that I remember was about a heavy emphasis placed on confirmation. Kind of what confirmation is enough. But you, what, all you're really doing is you're reaffirming your baptismal vow for the mouth suit. We made a big deal of that thing to get the confirmation suit, lady, yeah. confirmation like dress. Then we had, had a public examination the Sunday before confirmation. So she shivers up to those down on the spine there a lot of times. Mm -hmm. yep. <clears throat> I'm afraid sometimes people thought that was a, as a graduation <laughs> instead of a transfer point. Don't really. <clears throat> If you went into our church today, we have a, a, a board thing that you can leaf through and it shows all the confirmation pictures since 1915, 16, something like that. And every year that, that the kids are confirmed, then they get their thing in the thing. So it's really nice. Um, have any of you ever held a position in the church? What heaven I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, Philip, <laughs> yeah. I'm currently president of the Ladies Aid Group and also representative for the L, uh, Lutheran World Missionary Society. Okay. <laughs> I came here in 51 to teach school, and I taught school at St. John's Hill for 31 years. And I have done almost everything that has to be done, principal and everything, teaching Sunday school, singing in the choir. My husband just died six years and seven months ago today, sorry, uh, held who's on the school board, his father and grandfather on the school board, <coughs> and then when and Bob held almost every job except president of the congregation. And my husband held something like that too. Carol, like you say, that was a day and age when yeah. the young men stepped forward and did things within the congregation. Nowadays, you have to beg people. You have to beg her on the feet to get them. But the young men back there, because John and Tony, John, Bob and Tony were 
were involved in the church, within the school and the church. I make all the baby Afghans for every baby that's born in our church. Wow. For about 40 years, I was heavily involved, but not, not in this congregation. I taught in a Lutheran school up in Cleveland, Ohio, there for almost 20 years. And I served three congregations up there. I was a secretary of the congregation. I served on the Board of Trustees of the Lutheran High School Association. And I think it was an elder there in a couple of places like that. But not around not in this congregation. But you were born and raised in the Oh, yeah. That's what took you. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Uh, which generation are you and your family? Let's see. I think third. Third one. Third. Third, yeah. yeah. I think mine would be four people then living with me. Mm -hmm. That would be Bob's grandfather, Bob's father, Bob, and all them living at the farm. Yeah, mm -hmm. four generations. We live on the family farm. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense. 1904. Yeah. Wow. And do you guys know the reason your family came to Lenaway? My mother or my father grew up in Iowa and he belonged to the German church there. My grandfather came from Germany and settled in Iowa because he had a girlfriend that had come from Ger earlier and he met her there and they got married. He had two sisters that came to Michigan and my mother grew up in Holloway. My uh, dad came from Iowa to meet his cousins. And my mother was a friend of his cousins, and that's how they met and got married. And they lived in uh, Iowa for seven years and had three children. And my mother was so homesick and sick all the time that my dad asked the doctor if he thought she should come back to Michigan. So they put everything on the train. My dad rode in the back with the horses and everything and came to Michigan and settled on my, my mother's father's farm. Yep. Okay. Anyone else? When my husband had this stroke, he wrote all this out, okay? Grandpa Hanke came to Adrian from Stettin, Germany in the 1850s, mass immigration to America during the Franco-Prussian War. He walked through the German Black Forest to report for induction into the uh, German army. And on the way back, he got from the physical, uh, the service official said he was too short. So he had to go home and wait a year so that he could come back again. Well, on his way going home, he passed his uncle's house at 2 in the morning, and his uh, uncle and the family were getting ready to, well, there was a band playing and everything, they were getting ready to go to the United States. And so uh, his uncle said uh, he would have paid Bob Grandpa's passage, uh, but they were leaving tomorrow morning, so 20 of us left early that morning from Brendan, Brendan Harbor for America. And uh, Bob and Bob's grandpa ended up in Adrian, okay? And, okay, Uncle said, I'll give you a cabin boys thing ticket. Later, uh, his uncle already had relatives in Adrian, and it was a furniture store. And Bob said, that sound like Beck and Egan's, okay, which is going back. So uh, they arrived in New York City, the immigration center, then they left on the immigration train for Toledo and then to Adrian. And he uh, lived on Beecher Street and worked for Aunt Laura Haviland. And uh, he worked the farm there. And then uh, Grandpa married Barbara Usler, and they lived with uh, Fred and Blanche. And then they lived on the farm on Howell Highway, and then they bought the farm on Academy Road, and it's been there in the family since 1904. And that's how his grandpa, his grandfather was an orphan. But I tried to trace back the history, it gets kind of, you can only go so far. But that's how my husband got to be. And his mother was a school teacher, she taught uh, children with special needs. My, my uh, grandparents on my dad's side and my dad, they lived in Blissfield for a lot of years and they had a dairy business for, uh, it was called Waller and Son and they delivered uh, 
milk before my dad went to school every day. And then eventually they moved to Adrian, and that's when they joined St. John's then. They, uh, up until then, they went in Blissville, one of the churches there. Okay. Anyone else? My grandfather, Denton, was an only child. Now, his father fought in the Franco Prussian War also. And my grandfather told me when he was about six years old, he came to this country. He always told about how he was coming across on a boat there in Atlanta and Ellis Island, how he got seasick on the boat there. Well, then when he got to Adrian here, a bunch of the Germans were around here that, uh, I guess his, uh, his uncle, his mother's brother, also came. See, his, uh, his uncle had also fought in the Franco Prussian War. And the story goes that the Franco Prussian War was so horrible on both sides that his uncle has almost lost his mind for that there, time there. I think we're listening to the Bruce. And Dick, why don't you mention about that ship? That's where they yeah, were. Well, no, that's, yes, that's where the whole German. All the Germans up on the, on the northeast corner, probably the fourth paragraph, they called the old Dutch Hill up there. You were either German Catholic or German Lutheran up in that area there. My Lutheran. husband's family was there. And he also told how when he, he was about six years old, he came. He had a relative that lived on on, um, on Butler Street, and he, or he, he, he teach him how to talk English in that case there. He went to the schools here at uh, in, uh, in St. John. I think he only went about as far as the seventh grade. Once, once you learn to read and write, then you're ready for, for the workforce, so to speak. And like I, I wish not, Steve, my grandfather died when I was about my 20. I never thought to ask him what life was like back in the old country at the time. Ever. Yeah. This is Bob's grandma and grandfather's uh, wedding life, wedding mm -hmm. certificate that was signed by Pastor Trautman and what have yeah. you. And not only that, but when you came from Germany, you were not a citizen of the United States. And so you had to go ahead and okay. apply for naturalization papers and all of that. And then you had to be recommended in one of the former Senators or representatives from here, rep represented, represented Bob's grandfather, but then they had to carry the registration cards. And it says United States of America Department of Justice registration card of alien female. And so Bob's grandmother picked everything that's in here, her picture, her thumbprint, and they had to carry this with them. So I have his grandmother's and his grandfather's. Alien, alien papers, alien registration cards that they had to carry. But then they had their naturalization papers, and I still have Bob's grandf. I married into the family farm. <laughs> and when I start going through the family farm information, mm -hmm. I have found a lot, and I can't throw stuff away. Mm -hmm. But then even their uh, naturalization papers and stuff, and then they have how they purchased the farm. But it wasn't easy coming over like that. I mean, you were a foreigner, and you had to fight. No, I got to. Well, Not days. You just come across the border, and it's fine. <laughs> Along that same line, uh, my grandmother was was born in this country of German parents up here, up here in Deerfield. When she married my grandfather, of course, she did naturalize citizen. We've been born here. Because before World War One, they were considered aliens. And both my grandma and my grandfather had me fingerprinted as oh, yeah. aliens. Yeah, right. yeah. Even I mean. though she even though she was a native born American at the time. Yeah, because I think Grandma yeah. Usler was born in Scotland too. Yeah. yeah. But because she was married. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, right. And then this is the state of Michigan uh, circuit court giving them their right to be here. <laughs> hmm. All of this. I'm going to throw, no, I won't. Well, in all fairness, so to the American people, the Germans were very pro-German during World War I. And even at the beginning of World War II, a lot of them were very pro-German, yes. And I guess after we got attacked by, Pearl, by the Japanese in Pearl Harbor, things changed around that there. <laughs> no, I got to remember you had Grandpa Pitchy Darrell off of, they thought Hitler was a good, good guy over there. Yeah. And then even some of the young men from our congregation, they were either killed in World War II or they were in a prison camp. Yeah. One of the men that we yeah. thought might be here tonight yeah. was in a prison camp. In a, I think it was a German prison camp for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here? This country, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a member of our congregation. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, okay. Um, 
Bob Madison. Bob Madison. Bob Madison. Bob Madison. I don't think he likes to talk about that. Three he does not like to well, talk I, about it. Any of those young men no. that were in there did not like to talk about it. And some of them were at the Battle of the Bulge and everything. Yeah. But the lady that I lived with, she said, Grace, you don't talk about anybody in this congregation. Because they're all interrelated. <laughs> And that's, that's and still true, true today. Mm -hmm. It's true yeah. even today. We have a list of still cousins and yeah. family. Yeah. Now the congregation is changing yeah. because the older ones are dying yeah. off and the kids that you had are scattered yeah. and we're getting more young ones into the congregation, but they're from all over. So you don't have, well, just going through trying to think of some of the old families. Yeah. I bet there were a few kids going to St. John Lever that didn't have cousins in the same room there. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can remember teaching a class that three cousins were in there. Mm -hmm. The three Limbacher boys. <laughs> <laughs> so would you guys say that during the time when you were children going to the church, or even stories from your parents going there, that the church was much more closer than it is now, and why do you think the reason of that is? Because they're all related. But really and truly, back then, as you said about the closeness and what have you, you had your church and you had your school, mm -hmm. and all the kids from those parents went to St. John's mm -hmm. school, and they always said that if you do anything wrong in school, so you're going to know about before you get home. And so there was that closeness. Nowadays, I'm going to get into a subject that I don't like to talk about. We closed our school about, what, 10, 11 years ago? That was one of the hardest things that had to be. And I think that's what split our congregation in a way at that time. Now we are once again trying to meld and be together. But when they closed that school, you lost the closeness, you lost the camaraderie of that. And I have been told, I didn't close it, pardon me. It took two men to close it. I was told, though, that at that time, talking to the superintendent of schools in uh, Ann Arbor, that there was nothing you could have done to keep our school going because the powers that be had made up their mind to close the school because of the, come on, money. 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 because of the money. But now we have a daycare, a beautiful daycare, and one of our former students is the head of the daycare, and that is going quite well, but it needs a lot of help. But when you lose, as you say, the school and the church and the camaraderie, now you have kids going every which way, and the parents living all over because transportation is so much easier now, you're going to lose some of that. And you know how hard it is to get people in late to get people into bed, to get people in choir. But I was surprised on my computer last week, I got onto the St. John's Lutheran School. The kids, the comments that they made, and, and they keep in touch with each other all over. You know, the ones that went to St. John's School. And day school. Day school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you guys have any family heirlooms or memories that have been passed down to you or that you've kept from uh, past generations? I have, I have uh, my dad's compliment is um, catechism in German, but I've misplaced it somewhere. I was going to bring it tonight, but I put it somewhere, but I do, I know. Probably Grace has a lot of I have an antique farmhouse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I do. And things have been passed down. Pastor Manske gave a German Bible to Bob's dad. I have the pictures. I have the prayer books. I have Bob's parents' confirmation and stuff like that. And going through it, <clears throat> moving back into the farmhouse and going through the stuff, I cannot throw it away. So there are boxes labeled and everything else with what's there. And I will not, I will not. <clears throat> and then talking about children, as we were before, when the parents had a son, oh my Lord, that son was precious. Nothing like a son. Mm -hmm. I have Bob's baby book from before he was born with no sin. I have everything, his baptism stuff, his everything, his godparents stuff. 
But going through everything at the farm, I have not found anything for the girls. Bob had two sisters after he was born. <laughs> Nothing for the girls. And then when they were, uh, when Bob was going to Michigan State, he was a state farmer for the year, and when he was going to Michigan State, his mother kept writing him letters. Have you found the girl yet? Have you found the girl yet? <laughs> well, then he found the girl, you know? And, but the son could do nothing wrong. <laughs> Except probably marry the wrong woman. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, it's just something that the German people put all that. things in their son, thinking that the life is going to go on and on and on. My grandma and grandpa had ten kids, nine girls and one boy. Oh my God. Mm. <laughs> Pastor Rudolph. Rudolph Schwann could do no wrong. Mm. And he was, you know. Mm. But it's just interesting what they had that put on. And our farm was the dropping off place for any relative that didn't have a place to stay. There was always a room there, and I don't know where in the world they found all the room, but there was always a room there where they could come and stay, and they were never turned away. And during the Depression, when things were bad, and these stories were told to me by Bob and by his mother and aunt, people from the congregation would come out to the farm and say, Fritz, I don't have money, I don't have this, but I need to feed my family. So Bob's dad, Fred, would give him a chicken or give them eggs, or what have you. And that was that was what you did with neighbors mm -hmm. back then. And you also had the barter system. Mm -hmm. And then, not only that, but we were also involved with the um, Siena Heights and St. Joseph's Academy and the Mother House and all of that. It, it's interesting what can be done. I went in to talk to Sister Peg Albert two years ago, telling her what it used to be like down there when they farmed all that land and just sharing with her what, how things change. And I give you credit for wanting to find out what is going on in this county now, for you being such a young age. Yeah. Life is different. <laughs> you better have an education thing to get all that. <laughs> Are you gonna, every one of them is in Iowa. Are you going to have an interview for, for the Irish in Illinois County? Le, um, no. She's Boy, I'll tell you that. Go around Hudson once. Yeah. That would be an interesting note up there, too. So, some, of the, some of the prejudice those Paul have had when they first came back to the potato farm or family when I remember years ago. <laughs> a few years ago, we used to have Oktoberfest over mm -hmm. the grape. Oh, wow. Oh, you should have seen Mayor Berryman and his. Mayor <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hosen. And his Mayor Hosen. <laughs> You get this group talking, and even if you get more, yeah, the stories that come yeah. out. Right? <laughs> uh, were there any traditional German holidays or oh, events yeah. that you used to have oh, in your family? Sure enough. Yeah. And Christmas Eve. Yeah, Christmas they used to have a mission festival here too. Yeah, a mission festival. And we used to have the Walther League that went from yeah. congregation to congregation, right. the young people. And our sauerkraut supper. Sauerkraut supper, yeah. Yes. We're still having our sauerkraut supper. And don't forget the bread How many years in oh, the Yes, yeah, yeah. they would be had or sell those. Yeah. Yeah. I think Julie oh, Paul, I, I looked it up and it's just about as long as we've had the church. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I. Uh, Look through the ladies' they book because yeah. they had it first. And, yeah. Yeah. and then, uh, some of the much of that was in German. I couldn't yeah. understand it, but it told you the day that they turned it over to the women. I mean, we said we would send over 700, yeah. 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 Over 700 people last year. Mm -hmm. Grandma Kotke would sit out on the fire and escape peeling potatoes. Isn't yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a congregational event because there's, there's somebody cutting cabbage or something. I mean, it's, I got the everything. Yeah. I mean, everything is homemade. I mean, from scratch. Yeah. Do you have any uh, family names that were changed from their original German names to a more American name? Again, please. Names. <laughs> they changed. Oh yeah, the name changed. Yeah. Bob's grandparents had been H A N D K E or something. There's Thank two you. or three different spellings, and then it was changed to him to Thank H A N K E. I don't remember ever seeing anything any different. 
But because I have papers from the different buying a property in that. Now you look on my well, I got my uh, grandfather's mother. Her maiden name was Bruce, but it wasn't spelled like Bruce in this, in this country. It was spelled about three or four letters and that kind of stuff. There. See what actually happened when they got off the boat there. They were taking their name up, and they wrote it down phonetically. Mm -hmm. And some of these European names aren't spelled phonetically. And that's the trouble there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So many, so many little stories that yeah, I really are funny. Are. You know, yeah. people on and on. Especially mm -hmm. the teachers that we had and principals that we had and Bob's mother, our father being on the school board and having secret school board meetings out at the farm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My husband would educate me. <laughs> That's good. Um, now I know you guys have talked a little bit about some uh, prejudice and a little bit of discrimination, but are there any particular discrimination stories that you might want to share about either your personal life or your parents, grandparents, anything you might remember? But when our kids would get out of school, they would be getting out from Draker or from the high school, and they would be coming down the street at Frank Street, and our kids would be going out the back or the front, and you could just feel the tension. By the time they got over to Monument Park, there would be a fight. There would be a fight. <laughs> and whether or not that was discrimination or if that was just kids being kids. But they did talk. Talk kids uh, where Draker is now. If they walked down that way, they were. They won't. And they I had children, well, one girl especially, that when she had to take the bus, uh, get the public school bus, myself and another teacher would have to walk her to the uh, high school to drink her because she was scared to death because of what would happen on the bus.